Saul says, Jesus, you are welcome. Come in the house. Everybody say come. Come in the house. Come in the house. Jesus. Jesus, you are welcome. Come in the house. Let your glory. Let your glory fill the house. Glory. Welcome, Jesus. You are welcome. Let your glory fill the house. Let your glory fill. Let your glory fill the house. Glory fill the house. Jesus. Jesus, you are welcome. Let your glory fill the house. One more time. Come in. Your father thank you hallelujah. jesus hallelujah come into the house come to the house lord hallelujah we welcome him to the house hallelujah as we stand for prayer this morning dear gracious father lord god we welcome you in this place hallelujah lord god have your way jesus have your way god hallelujah lord god we welcome you right now jesus hallelujah lord god we stand boldly before you, Father God. Lord God, you know everything. You see everything, Lord God. You are God that sees us and you hear us, Father God. And we welcome you, Lord God, right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord God. Save, deliver, set free. Hallelujah, Lord God. Anybody ill, Lord God, touch their bodies right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We welcome the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, Lord God. Oh, God, shake us up today. Hallelujah, Lord God. Rain down your anointing. Hallelujah, as never before, Lord God. We bless your name. Lord God, for you are worthy. Hallelujah, Lord God. You're worthy of praise and you're worthy of worship. Hallelujah. Oh God, hallelujah, Lord God. You're good and you're good all the time, Lord God. And as we go further into the service, Lord God, welcome and have your way, Lord God. Oh my God, let something be said, Lord God, to touch. Hallelujah, Lord God. Your people, hallelujah, Lord God. Oh, my God in glory, shake, rattle, and roll. Hallelujah today, Jesus, Lord God. Touch, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, Lord God. In the ailing, hallelujah, Lord God. Open up the minds to receive your word, Father God. We thank you for the ones that are here and those that are on their way, Father God. Oh, God, we bless you this morning. We honor and praise you, Lord God, for your goodness and your grace and your mercy, Lord God. It's ever sufficient, Lord God. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory, God. Now we call forth for the scripture reading by Minister Gary Bush, Jr. Scripture. Praise the Lord. He will be coming out of 1 Corinthians 16, 14 through 16. 1 Corinthians 16, 14 through 16. All right. I will read those verses in your hearing um i'm going to read again first corinthians chapter 16 verses 14 15 and 16. 14 let all your things be done with charity i beseech you brethren ye know the house of stephanus that it is the first fruits of achaia achaia and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints 16 
that ye submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. Once again, I read 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 14, 15, and 16. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his word. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> we welcome you to Abundant Love Sunday morning worship. We thank you for uh, joining us this morning here in the sanctuary, as well as those uh, viewing this morning uh, via way of live stream. Thank you to our visitor that has returned from last week. Miss Josie, we see you. <laughs> um, our prayer is that something is said or done during this service that will reveal God's true love for you and draw you closer to the Lord. This week, we will continue to study out the chapter number 16 um, in the first book uh, I'm sorry, in the book of First Corinthians. So uh, for the you, know, you guys that are viewing, if you would like to follow along during Bible study and you need an outline, you can comment with your email address below or you can email us at AbundantLove at Frontier.com or you can go to our website. Our website is AbundantLove-Church.org to receive an outline. Abundant Love will have our annual awards and fellowship dinner today, right after morning worship. We definitely are glad and honored to show recognition to the diligent uh, laborers for the Lord, and we'll be able to break bread together today, amen? The women fellow women's fellowship is as follows. Um, on Saturday, February the 24th, here at the church, this reads as follows. Is your soul seeking more? Come and see what the Holy Spirit has in store for you. Join us for a fellowship filled with love, laughter, learning of the Father, revealing your path of joy and peace. So on the 24th, next Saturday, from 3 to 5 p.m. here at Abundant Love, uh, uh, Sister Gaither says, see you there. On February the 25th, we will have our children's department have their annual Black History uh, program as well. Everyone, please come out and learn of our heritage and support our children of today. We had one very special birthday this past week. It was none other than our sister Stephanie Hobson on the 16th. Happy birthday. Woo, okay. <laughs> We would like to thank everyone that has given to uh, this particular ministry. And if you haven't had the opportunity to do so, um, to sow a seed at Abundant Love, all you have to do is sign into your cash app. Our cash tag is dollar sign Abundant Love Church, or you can give through Givelify. Um, our Givelify name is Abundant Love Church. Just make sure that says in Fort Wayne, Indiana. If you're ever in our area, we welcome you to any of our services. Our address is 2615 New Haven Avenue. And on Sundays, we have Sunday school panel at 9 a.m., followed by our Sunday school here in the sanctuary at 9.50 a.m. And then our morning worship would be at 11 a.m. On Mondays, our corporate prayer is at 6.30 p.m. And then on Wednesdays, we have intercessory prayer at 6 p.m. followed by our Disciples Academy Bible Study at 6.30 p.m. Now, if you miss any of the live streams, all of these are archived for you. You can find those on our Facebook page, Abundant Love Church, or on our YouTube channel, Capital A, Capital L Ministries, these are all of our announcements for today and now in the hands of our music department. Praise the Lord. Come on, put your hands together in here. Clap your hands, clap your hands, clap your hands, clap your hands. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
Amen. In honor of Black History Month, we've been choosing uh, old songs, Negro spirituals and such. Uh, this morning we have one not so old, but very much in the spirit and tradition. How many know you got your mansion now? Look at somebody say, I believe. Oh, I have my mansion now. Oh, whoa, I believe. Oh, I have my mansion now. Oh, oh, I believe. One more time. Oh, I have my mansion now. Oh, whoa. Somebody say, I believe. How many know Jesus promised? Look at somebody say, Jesus promised. And he does not break his promises.
Look at somebody say, Jesus promised. How many know he'll take care of you? I can call him when. And I can call him when. I can call him when. And I can call him when. I can call him in the morning. Call him in the morning. I can call him in the morning. I can call him in the morning. In the morning. In the morning. In the morning. I can call him in the morning. And when I call him, when I call him, he'll make everything all right. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how big Jesus promised. Jesus promised he'll take care of me. Clap your hands right there. You're not clapping your hands. How many know Jesus made you a promise? Somebody said promises are made to be broken. But Jesus is the maker of unbroken promises. Amen. The Lord will keep his word. What about you? All right, look over to your neighbor and say, Jesus keeps his promises. Yes, he does. He's a promise keeper. Amen. Amen. The maker of unbroken promises is what he is. All right, how many glad to be here today? Don't fool me. Put a smile on your face then. Look at your neighbor. See if they, you can convince them that's a real smile. The Bible says, this is the day that the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice. Let me see you rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, okay, all right, all right, okay, all right, okay, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Amen. Bless you. How many know the Lord is good? Amen. He's good to us. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to every generation. And so we're happy. So let's give the music department another hand. Didn't they do wonderful this morning? They did a wonderful job this morning. Amen. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Want you to prepare yourselves to give this morning. How many know it's a blessing to be able to give? It is. So I want you to prepare yourselves to give today. Amen. You all know that we have some projects coming. Those of you all that have made a commitment to start at least $25, would you do that with us today? And we believe that the Lord will bless what we contribute this morning. Amen. All right. Incidentally, if you need an envelope, they're going to see that you get an envelope this morning. If you're going to use cash or write a check, you need an envelope. On that envelope, if you would write your name uh, very legibly so that the people can read it. Amen. You know, you all do know that doctors write prescriptions on purpose so that you can't read them. And so the pharmacist can read them. Amen. So, but we don't want you to be a doctor this morning. You might be a doctor, but we don't want you to be a, we don't want you to write a prescription this morning. Uh, we want you to write your name. We want it to be legible. Uh, we want the people that record the offerings to be able to give you proper credit today. If you make a check out, you have to make that check payable to the Abundant Love Church. And uh, uh, we say this, if you're writing it today and the check don't come in until Friday, if you put Friday's date on it and circle Friday's date, we will honor your check on the day that you circle it. Amen. And I make this promise. This is a promise that I keep. If we cash your check before the day and you incur cost, we will pay the cost. Amen, somebody. Because it's the right thing to do. But trust me, if you circle it, we're not going to cash it. <laughs> Amen. All right. So if you're going to use cash or check, you need an envelope. Incidentally, if you're going to use your debit card and your credit card, 
Uh, Sister Natasha Hilliard has the card slider. And if you just kind of wave at her right now so she can look around and see you, she will actually come to your location and receive your contribution at your location. Amen. All right. Then certainly, uh, last but not least, we receive uh, contributions uh, via our cell phones. And at this present time, we only use a couple of applications. Uh, we use uh, the application called Givelify. It's a church application. Um, and we can be found as the Abundant Love Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. In fact, I use Givelify from time to time. And you also have the ability to designate a church, your home church, in the Givelify application. And so every time you pull it up, it'll take you automatically to your home church, unless you want to give uh, to another ministry. Of course, uh, I give to other ministries uh, through my um, Givelify application. And then our second application we use is Cash App. And our hashtag address for Cash App is dollar sign Abundant Love Church. And you are able. The thing I love about Cash App uh, uh, is that I don't have to grab an envelope. I don't have to grab an ink pen. All I have to do is open the app, put how much I want to send, put a little notation on it, and it's gone. Amen. I don't even have to wait until Sunday to do it. I can do it on Saturday night. I can do it in the morning. I can do it in the middle of the night. Okay. Okay. I can do <laughs> I can do <laughs> I can, I can do it whenever the Lord moves me, amen, and be a blessing to the house of God. And so I want you to be very uh, generous this morning, amen. Incidentally, I also want to mention uh, we are moving expeditiously through service. Uh, today is our awards, our service awards banquet, amen. And we take this opportunity to recognize those that have given stellar service and exceptional service in the work of the Lord. Amen. I, I said amen. amen. Okay, I'm just trying to see if you all awake because the Bible says we are to know those that labor among us. Amen. And so we are doing that today. Amen. We've prepared a meal. The meal is free. You don't have to pay anything. All you have to do is the, the old folks said is put your knees under the table. Amen. And we're going to serve you today because it's all about service. Amen. Okay. All right. Everybody ready to give? Okay, whatever you have, whether it be your cash or your check or your envelope or your card or your phone, I'm going to ask you to grab it and hold it up here right now. Pastor, why do you ask us to do this? I ask you to do this because we lift our sacrifice to the Lord. When they went into the temple and they offered a sacrifice, the Bible said that when the fire came down and consumed it, it said that the smoke rose as a sweet-smelling savor, a sweet-smelling aroma into the nostrils of God. Amen, somebody. And so when we lift our offering, we're lifting it to him, and we say, honor our sacrifice. Let it be a sacrifice that you'll be pleased with. And, Father, as you receive our sacrifice, bless and return it to us. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to give. It is an opportunity. It's a blessed opportunity to give. And so, Father, we pray now that you would bless every giver, whatever means we're using, whether we use envelope or we use the card slider or we use our cell phone. However we give, you are the God that sees, knows, and understands. So bless what we give and perform your word. Perform your word. You hasten, you hurry to perform your word to us. You said that if we gave, you would give it back to us. Good measure, good healthy measure. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over would men give into our bosom. So we uh, desire for you to fulfill your word upon our offering. In Jesus' name and the Lord's people said, thank God. Amen and amen. All right, they're getting ready to All right, you can search. You can search high and low. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter where you go. 
you won't ever find. You won't ever find. You'll find nobody like the Lord. Nobody like you can search the Lord. high and low. You can search high and low. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter where you go. You won't ever find. You won't ever find. Nobody like the Lord. I say nobody like Jesus. Hallelujah. Tell them again. Say nobody like Jesus. How many know there's nobody like Jesus? Andre Cross didn't say it like that. Andre Cross said it like this. He said, "Can't nobody do me like Jesus." Can't do me like the Lord. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. He's my friend. He's my friend. I said, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Do me like Jesus. Put your hands on it. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. Do me like the Lord. Can't nobody. One time, one time. I can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. I can't nobody do me like Jesus. 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 Can't nobody do me Oh, heal my body. Told me to run on. Heal my body. Told me to run on.
Clap your hands, clap your hands, clap your hands. Now listen, listen, listen. Here's what's happening. If you haven't, if you haven't caught on, the Bible says that we're to sing unto the Lord all ye lands. That means every time we get together to sing, you're supposed to sing with us. And I know sometimes the word, you know, the songs that we sing got a whole lot of words, but this song right here only got one word. All you have to do to be able to say and sing this song is say nobody. Look at somebody say nobody. nobody. Look at somebody else say nobody. nobody. That's all you got to be able to do to sing today. All right, we're going one more round. We're going one more round. Come on, get on your feet. We're going one more round. Nobody. Y'all ready? You ready? Oh, nobody. 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 Somebody say, he's my friend. He's my friend. He's my friend. He's my friend. Come on, give me a wave offering. Come on, come on, have church. Have church with me. Have church with me. Half church, half church. You hear, you may as well praise him. Hallelujah. How many know he's your friend? Wave your hand and say, I'm thank God he's my friend. Thank you, Jesus. Some of y'all don't know. Some of y'all don't know this scripture. Some of y'all don't know this scripture. Let, let me tell you where it says he's your friend. He said in St. John, he said, I don't call you servant anymore. Because the servant don't know what the master is doing. But because you know your master's will. He said, I call you friend. Look, somebody say, he calls me friend. Y'all thought Israel made that song up. And that song is in the Bible. I am a friend of God. I'm going to leave it alone. How many know you're a friend of God? The Bible says that Abraham was called the friend of God. Amen. And if you know like I know, certain friends get certain perks. Everybody can't go in my refrigerator. But my friends can go in my refrigerator. Anybody saying nothing in here? I don't share my chocolate with everybody. But my friends can get some of my chocolate. Now, I mean, not too much, but they can get some of it. Amen. And that's what the Lord does for us. The Lord calls us. The Lord calls us friend. Amen. All right. God bless you. Clap your hands there one more time. Amen. In honor of our Black History Month, amen, we've had a Black History presentation 
on every Sunday and today is no different than the rest of the Sundays. We have a black history presentation and we're going to call the moderator of our black history representation. Uh, amen. Would you all receive? That's right. Just bring it over to her. That's right. Bring it over. Amen. There you go. Amen. Relay race. Hand off. Okay. All right. You all receive Sister Vera Drew with a hearty amen. To another segment of our Black History uh, celebration. On this Sunday, we're going to use the men to represent. Let all the brothers say amen. Amen. On last week, we had all the women, well, several of the women. This Today, we're going to have several of the men, and I'm trying to look for my first presenter. I know he was up there ushering. Oh, there he is. Okay, we're going to bring our first presenter. And remember, this is a, a guess who? Okay. Uh, this is a guess who? This person will give you some clues, and you have to guess who it is. And there's my eagle eye. Uh, well, I, my eagle eye is presenting today. I think I'm going to use Elder Greg as a good eagle eye. He's going to watch the audience and see whose hand goes up first for me. Amen. All right, let's start with our first presentation. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here today, uh, and I thank you for allowing me uh, just a moment of your time to talk a little bit about myself and my career. Uh, just the other day, I couldn't help but think back over the extraordinary life that I've, I have lived, um, which is a life uh, of humility, to say the least. Uh, being born in the inner city of Philadelphia, much wasn't expected of me other than to learn a trade, possibly work for a local union. However, it was my parents who taught me the importance of reaching for the stars. With that encouragement, I studied hard and obtained my degree in aerospace engineering. And although that wasn't enough for my never-ending desire for excellence, in 1966, I immediately entered into the Air Force Flight School where I earned my combat pilot wings. I flew 144 combat missions over the course of my career, with 65 of those taking place in Vietnam. After my time as a combat pilot, I spent several years as a flight instructor, but of course that still wasn't enough. That didn't satisfy my desire to accomplish more. So I obtained my master's degree in aerospace engineering and my doctorate in philosophy. And then that call came, that phone call I never thought would happen. I was informed that I had been one of 35 candidates out of roughly 10,000 applicants selected to work for NASA. Over the next 11 years, I would have the honor of traveling to space four separate times. The first time was in 1983. I was the mission specialist aboard the space shuttle Challenger, which some of you may know. The second mission to space was in 1985, where I once again was the mission specialist aboard the same shuttle, the Challenger. Except this time we headed for the International Space Station. Following the tragic Challenger explosion, I then returned to NASA, determined to help the space program after such tragic events. In 1991, I made my third trip to space aboard the Orbiter Discovery in order to conduct experiments for the Department of Defense, some of which at the time were classified. My fourth and final trip to space came in 1992. Once, a, once again, making the trip aboard the Orbiter Discovery in order to launch a classified military communications satellite. I enjoyed my time at NASA, logging a total of 28 days, or better stated, 688 hours total time in space. And in 1997, I had the privilege of being inducted into the International Space Hall of Fame. And then again in 2010, I was inducted into the US Astronauts Hall of Fame. Who am I? Pardon me? Eugene, unfortunately, no, but that was a good guess. Unfortunately, nope, close, though. 
Yes, it was Guyon Blueford. Okay. Amen. And you know you will be getting a gift certificate, and as soon as Mother Kyra comes out, she will present that. Very good. Okay, my second presenter is on his way. This mic has one bar, so if it die, I'm going to speak real loud. I was born in 1877 in Paris, Kentucky, an almost exclusively African-American community. I am an American inventor, businessman, and community leader. I conducted experiments with a liquid that gave sewing machine needles a high polish that prevented the needle from burning fabric as it was sold. In 1905, I accidentally discovered that the liquid could be used to also straighten hair. I also created a hair refining company based on my product inventions along with a complete line of hair care products which include hair growing cream, black hair oil dye, and a curved tooth comb for hair straightening in 1910. Following the success of my company, I became a well-known citizen in Cleveland, Ohio, go bug eyes, and achieved <laughs> financial success leading to my purchase of a new automobile. In 1922, I witnessed an accident between a horse-drawn carriage and a car which sparked inspiration to, vent, to prevent the likelihood of future events occurring. At this time, such accidents were uh, common in part because traffic signals had only two options, stop and go, which switched with no warning. Looking to solve this problem, I have been in a traffic signal featuring movable arms that directed the traffic to stop, go, or stop in all directions. The third option, a forerunner to today's yellow light, not only prevented collisions between vehicles, but also allowed pedestrians to cross the street safely. Although my invention was not the first traffic signal, it controlled traffic better than many earlier signals had. I patented it in 1923 and eventually sold the rights to this device to the General Electric Corporation for $40,000. Who am I? Garrett Morgan. Okay, Garrett Morgan was that inventor. And we're going to ask you uh, not to raise your hand until they say, who am I? Okay, so that Elder uh, Smith can catch it as it comes up. Okay? Uh, okay, I, this is for... Okay. And I had a runner, and my runner had to run someplace else, so. Uh, yo, yo, yep. Gabriella. <laughs> okay, my next presenter is on his way. Already up here. Oh, he's oh, he ready. Right, all right, he's we right behind. Here, we ready. <laughs> we ready. It's the showmanship. It's the showmanship for me, baby. Oh, man, I know y'all see that. The hardware, you know, you got to put them up. You got to put them up. You got to put them up. Put them up. Put them up. Boy, we, we stick and move, baby. Uh, if you didn't know, during the Jim Crow era, I was the first black world heavyweight, heavyweight champion <laughs> from 1908 to 1915. 
Hold on, I got to count them out. Took too many shots. Sell them. Sell them you. So in them seven years, I actually got dubbed with a fight called the fight of the century. And this, this man, we, we know he was a white man because they was running the boxing game back then. But he came out of retirement, but he know these hands were sweet. So <laughs> he came out of retirement to get knocked back into retirement. <laughs> so after I fought, you know, shimmy, you know, stick and move. After that, with me beating him, I started riots for years. They didn't like that a black man beat a white man in the boxing ring. But he didn't know, like I said, these hands was lethal. And the white man that I fought, just to give you a little hint, his name was Jeffries. Okay, see, we got somebody out here that, boy, you know about these hands, boy. They wasn't ready for these hands. And so I was also deemed the most influential boxer in history. Who am I? Got it. Jack Johnson, all right. <laughs> Okay, Jack Johnson. Somebody knew a little bit about boxing. Okay, and, and I am going to remind you, you can only win one time. So if you, if you get, a, get a gift certificate, we'll move it on to the next one. Our next presenter is on his way. I was born August the 8th, 1866. I was the first African American explorer who, who accompanied Robert Peary on a seven voyages to the Arctic over a period of 23 years. We spent a total of 18 years on an expedition together. I was known for my participation in 1908 in 1909, expedition that claims to have reached the geographic North Pole on April the 6th, 1909. I was the first of their part of my party to reach the North Pole. I traded with the Enoch, which is Eskimos, and mastered the Enoch language. They called me, now y'all bear with me, Mahara Palak. I was the only now non-Enoch who became skilled in driving the dog sleds and training dog teams in a unique way. Me and my partner covered over thousands of miles and reached the farthest north. Who am I? Correct. She is correct. Matthew Henson. Very good. I have, oh, one more presenter. There he is. And he's on his way up. All right, my name is Wait, that's, that's not how I do it. <laughs> All right, I was born in 1904. Um, my research in the field of blood transfusions helped develop better techniques for blood storage, and my research was applied during World War II to help develop larger scale blood banks. Um, in this research, I discovered that blood plasma was able to be preserved two months through the deliquefaction or the separation of liquid blood form from the cells. Liquid blood from the cells. Um, when the plasma was ready to be used, 
it was able to be returned to its original state via the reconstitution. My thesis was so good, it landed me a doctor of science in medicine degree in 1940, and I was the first black person to receive a doctor of science degree. Who am I? I don't know, I'm not taking it. I am Charles Drew. And the order of service is going to go back to, no, 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 not, not yet. okay, back to you then. All right. Amen. Okay, give yourselves a hand for knowing a little bit about your black history. <laughs> On next week, we will have the children come up and they're going to present to you what they have learned all month and they were doing a very good job uh, so we will be sending up the children on next week and our last uh, we don't have a last presenter but we have a last gift we thank God for our pastor allowing us time to do this amen so we're going to present him as a presenter <laughs> amen Okay, and at this time, we're going to turn it back into the hands of our pastor, and he will come and further the service. Come on, let's keep it. We're still in service. Amen. We are still in service. Amen. Amen. Say amen for the mistress of ceremonies, Sister Marilyn Spann. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thanks. Eyes are coming. Eyes are coming. Praise God. Hallelujah. Y'all having a good time so far? Yeah. Isn't God real, real good? Yeah. He just gets gooder and gooder. Yeah. Can we all stand for prayer? Yeah. Hallelujah. We're going to have unity, community, prayer. In the name of Jesus. Dear gracious Father, Lord God, we bless your name, Lord God. We love you. Lord God, we adore you. Hallelujah, Lord God. You are worthy of all praise and worship, Father God, and we welcome you, Father God, once again, hallelujah, into the sanctuary. We thank you, Lord God, for your presence thus far, Lord God, as you continue to have your way in the service, Lord God. Move through the aisles, hallelujah, Lord God. Rain down your anointing power, hallelujah, Lord God. Bless as only you can bless, Lord God. Manifest your glory today, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for all the ones that are here, Lord God. Oh, my God, touch each and every one, Lord God. Lord God, with your spirit, hallelujah, Lord God. If there's anyone that's not feeling well, God, touch them right now, Lord God, and heal in Jesus' name. From the head to the toe, Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, for your healing, Lord God. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do, Lord God. Lord God, I came in this morning expecting, hallelujah. I pray that everyone came in expecting, Lord God, to receive something of you, Father God. We thank you, Lord God, for your presence. Even right now, we thank you for your mighty glory, Lord God. We thank you for healing, setting free, Lord God. Lord God, we take back what the canker world is trying to take from us. The devil does not win, Father God, for you win, Father God. You maintain all the power and glory, hallelujah, in Jesus' name, Lord God. You are great and great and worthy to be served. Play praise, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for doing it, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Lord God, and I pray, Lord God, as you go through each and every aisle, Lord God, every man, boy, girl, and child, every woman, Lord God, even our bishop, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, set on him today, Lord God, as he brings forth the word, Lord God. Bless him, Lord God, as only you can with your anointing power as he delivers the word of God to your people, Lord God. Open ears to hear and receive your word, Lord God. Open hearts to receive your word, Father God. We thank you right now. We give you the glory, God. We give you the glory, hallelujah, Lord God. We give you the glory, hallelujah. We give you the glory, hallelujah. We give you the glory in Jesus' name, Lord God. For your goodness, your grace, your kindness, and your mercy, hallelujah, is ever any. We bless your name, Lord God, and we give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, hallelujah, Lord God. As you guys remain standing, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today. It's none other than Bishop Gary Bush Sr. He's a mighty man of God. Hallelujah. Give him a hand clap. He's the mighty man of God. Hallelujah. Delivering the word as only he can. 
We thank you. We praise you. And Bishop, we love you in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. Come on, clap your hands, everybody in here. Clap your hands. Now, just, just for a moment, those same hands, raise those hands. On last, um, on last week, we talked about when it's corporate prayer time, we wanted you to be a participant. So I'm going to ask you with your hands raised, I'm going to ask you to be public with your prayer. And just for about the next 40 seconds, I want you to pray. Everybody's praying now. Open your mouth. 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 Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Raise your voice. Help us. Help us. Change the atmosphere. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you. Come on. That's right. Come on. Come on. 20 seconds. 20 more seconds. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Come on. Start the prayer hive. The prayer beehive. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. That's right. When Zion travailed, she brought forth. In Jesus' name, the Lord's people said, thank God. Amen. Come on, clap your hands one more time as you take your seat. All right, look at somebody and say, the Lord is good to us. Yes, he is. The Lord is so good. The Lord is so good to us. Yes, he is. Hallelujah. Bread of life sent down from glory. Many things you were on earth, a holy king, a carpenter. You are the living word, awesome ruler, gentle redeemer, God with us, the living truth, and what a friend we have in you. You are, help me sing it, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's what we, that's what we call you, manger born. Manger born, but on a tree, you died to save humanity. You are the living, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. That's what we, manger born but on a tree you died to save you man nothing you are one thing one time oh 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 the living word you are one more time oh, 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 oh. the living word hallelujah thank you Jesus yes stand to your feet one more time I want to call your attention to the first Corinthians chapter 16 I'm going to read verses 14 through 16 I need you all to pray for my voice I sang a little too hard at offering time and I've kind of lost control of it right now Yes. Oh, 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 oh.
1 Corinthians 16 and 14 says, Let all your things be done with charity. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I, I need to say that phrase again. That they have addicted themselves to service to the ministry of the saints. That ye submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. May the Lord bless you. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Need your prayers. I got to go somewhere in a hurry, but it's, I don't want you to tune this message out because it is just fitting that we here on our uh, church fellowship and service award day uh, speak about service to others. Amen, somebody. And so just before I go on, uh, I want to read that same passage of scripture from the Amplified version of the Bible. And here's what it says from the Amplified version. It says, let everything you do be done in love, which is true love to God and man as inspired and encouraged by God's love for us. 15 says, now, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus were the first converts and our first fruits of Achaia, mostly in Greece, and how they have consecrated and devoted themselves to the service of the saints, which are God's people. And then verse 16 says, I urge you to pay all deference to such leaders and to enlist, join them, and be subject to them, as well as everyone who joins and cooperates with you and labors earnestly. May the Lord bless you and bless his word. Uh, my theme today is devoted to service. Look at somebody and say, be devoted to God's service. Now tell them, make it your habit. Devoted to service. Make it your habit. I'd like to begin today's message uh, with a couple of quotes. Uh, one would have sufficed, but because it is Black History Month, I've tried to pull quotes out um, that are applicable to this month. And of course, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King is one of my famous, you know, favorite people to quote. So I've grabbed a quote from him again today. Uh, I've used this quote many times, but it's good to rehearse it in our ears. The quote says, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. That's the biblical principle of greatness. He that will be great among you, let him be the servant of all. And so true greatness is not your name on a plaque or a statue in front of the stadium. True greatness is the ability to serve other people in the name of the Lord. The second quote is by not so popular a fella. Uh, he is the former president of the nation of India, and his name is so long uh, that they don't even list it all in the encyclopedia. They'll tell you later, but his first three names, they just give you the initials. Uh, and it is A P J Abdul Kalam. He's a former president of India in the early 2000s. 
uh, but I thought his quote was very applicable to us today. And his quote says, to succeed in your mission, you must have single-minded devotion to your goal. In order to be successful to whatever mission you have set before you, you have to have a focus that is single-minded and only focuses on what you are trying to accomplish. Do you all know that the best laid plans fall in ruins because people get distracted about what they're going after? So when you set a goal, you set a high and a lofty goal, you have to keep that goal in front of you. You have to keep that goal present for you to focus on, and when things happen that try to detour your attention, you have to have something that will bring you back to your central focus. Amen. I know this is the day of cell phones and tablets and, um, you know, computers, but I still carry sticky notes. And I have sticky notes placed in very strategic places in my home. And they're just reminders. On the gooseneck lamp in my home office, I have a sticky note that says, focus, discipline, and don't procrastinate. First, that's the first thing I see every time I go to my office. It's a reminder to focus. What am I supposed to be doing? Discipline, even though you may feel like going to do something else, this is what you need to do. And don't procrastinate. Don't put it off until tomorrow because tomorrow isn't promised. And so to be successful, you got to have a focus and then you have to have a single-mindedness uh, multitasking is overrated. It's not how many things you can do, it's how many you can do well. You all have heard uh, the cliche that says jack of all trades. But normally a jack of all trades is a master of none. It's the thing that you focus and give your undivided attention you give maximum effort that you do well. Amen, somebody. And so as saints of God, service to others is and should be a staple in every believer's life. We cannot afford to be believers and be selfish people. We cannot only be concerned about ourselves and not concerned about anything else. Service then has to be a partner. It has to be mentioned in the same breath with believers in Jesus Christ. We are not just saved from our sins, but it's a good thing to be saved from our sins. But we're not just saved from our sins. We are saved to serve others. One of the purposes of you being saved is so that God can position you so that you can help other people. The power of the Holy Ghost, even though we make it be anointed for so many other things. Ooh, that was an anointed song. That was an anointed message. That was an anointed meal. We call everything anointed now. And that not that it's not anointed, but the purpose of the anointing was for you to be able to help somebody else. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and then ye shall be my. A witness is someone who can tell and enlighten somebody else to the truth. Your anointing is to help somebody else. If your anointing only helps you, I question whether or not you're anointed. Bless his name. And so we're not just saved from our sins, we're also saved to serve other people. Our call to follow Jesus 
It's not just a call to be like him, but it's a call to do as he did. It's not just enough to say, I'm like Jesus, but Jesus said, the works that I do, you're going to do those works. And so it's not just being like Jesus, it is finding ourselves doing what Jesus did. Jesus himself said that the Son of Man, referring to himself, did not come to be served. He didn't come to have other people serve and wait on him. But he came to serve and to give his life a ransom, not for his own sins. He came to give his life a ransom for many. We're here today because Jesus gave. God so loved the world that he he gave. Jesus so loved us that he, he gave his life. And, and so he came to give his life not to be served. And even though we serve him now, it, it's, it's reciprocated when we serve God because he served us first. Hello, somebody. So we too should live lives which exemplify care and concern. You cannot afford to be apathetic self-absolved, self-concerned. Listen, the world is bigger than your circle. And your impact must go beyond your private circle. There has to be a way to have influence upon other people and especially people who do not know the Lord. And so our lives should exemplify that we care it should exemplify that we are concerned and that care and concern is expressed through service that benefits others. People know you care when you do something that benefits them. Ain't nobody saying nothing in here. Hey Amen. I was in the grocery uh, store not long ago and the person in front of me, from my estimation, um, I don't know if they were homeless or really just down on their luck, but uh, they were trying to pay for their groceries, and they had spread out on the conveyor belt uh, a series of coins, just pennies and nickels and dimes. And I could see the frustration of the cashier because uh, she had things already rang up and they were trying to ascertain whether or not they had enough money to get it done. And I was the next person in line and there was quite a line behind us. And you know, if you're not real careful, you can get so caught up and you needing to get out of a place that you don't even pay attention to what's happening in front of you. And before I could get frustrated, the Lord said, say, look up there. They need help. And after they counted all the change and they were short, the cashier said, you don't have enough money. I said, how short is it? And this look of amazement just came over the face that said, how would somebody who doesn't know me take time to look into my situation and assist. Which is the statement of every true believer in Christ. There are people that you care for that they don't know that you care for them yet. But it's through works of service, doing something to benefit somebody else that convinces them that you care. They don't want to hear you say how much you care. They want to see how much you care. I know you care that I'm hungry, but do you care enough to give me a piece of bread? How can you say you love God, whom you've not seen at any time, and see your brother and your sister in need? And the Bible says, shut up your bowels of compassion. Well, pastor, I don't know what it means to shut up the bowels of my compassion. Sure you do. When you pull up to the corner and there's a guy on the corner with a sign and you look the other way and act like you don't see him. 
And I'm not saying give to everyone. But you can't tell me that you pass all of them and God hasn't told you to help at least one of them. Hello, somebody. And so we too should exemplify that we care, that we are concerned through the service that we give. And this service has to benefit others. It's not service unless somebody else benefits beside you. If you're the only person benefiting from what you're doing, that's not service. That's self-serving. But real service, look at somebody say, benefits others. Now put them on the spot. Look them in the eye and say, what do you have for me today? That's the question that's asked of the saint of God every day. Like the rich man laid who wouldn't so much lift his eyes. He'd only lift his hand and say, alms, what do you have for me today? Peter and John said, we don't have silver and gold. We don't have what you're looking for. But such as I have. So many people say I can't help because I don't have enough to help. Enough of what? Do you have enough of a smile to share it? Enough of a handshake to reach? You don't have to have it all. You just have to be willing to share what you have. It doesn't take anything away from I'm trying to calm down here. It doesn't take anything from you to be nice to people. In fact, it'll pay dividends because you reap what you sow. And if you show kindness to somebody else, somebody is going to show kindness to you. Bless his name. And so we have to show that we care. We have to show that we're concerned. We have to do it through service and service is what we do that benefits others. Now, this is not in my message, but I just feel impressed to do this at this time. Now, I don't want you to hold up your hand to say you're saved because we always do that. But I want you to think introspectively. I want you to think what you do as a Christian that helps other people. Go over it in your mind. What do I do as a Christian that's a benefit to somebody outside of me? How many people do I help? Can I help, mer help more people if I adjust how I do what I do? Sadly, many of us spend all of our lives living for ourselves with our own goals. This is the education I want. This is the job I want. This is the house I want. This is the family I want. This is the business I want. This is the promotion I want. And in all that personal planning, there's no planning to help anybody else. I love athletes who make it big and don't forget where they came from. It's a running back, former running back of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, played his college at the U, Florida. Or met him in Florida State, one of those Florida universities. When he finished his NFL career, he started building houses in Florida for single mothers who couldn't afford them. At last count, he was somewhere around 500 homes. That's somebody who has in mind helping somebody else. I love Michael Jackson. He was a great musician. I only have one thing against him. He sang a lie. He said, I'm going back to Indiana. And he had enough persuasion and money to put Gary back on the map. Gary 
used to be a booming, productive, industrial town when steel was at the top. And just his name and his influence would have put life in that community again. But you know what? He got sidetracked. I believe he meant it when he sang it, but I think he got too busy to go. Like many times we do. With a well intention, but we just never get around to it. Our lives are filled with, I am going to. I plan to. When I get this, and you can be waiting for conditions to be right a long time and never get around to what you should get around to. I don't suggest many movies, especially when you don't suggest Christian movies. But there's a movie that I'd like to suggest to you, and it's an Adam Sandler movie called Click. And it sounds funny, but there are so many true lessons in click because we want to run past certain things to get to other things. And when we get to the end, we will re we'll regret the things that we ran past. Hey, anybody saying nothing here? I'm glad I ran while I could. I don't miss running now because I did all my running. But to the person who never took time to run, and when you get to the place you can't run, can't jump, can't get out of the car without help, can't come down the steps without a banister. That's what the Bible says, remember now your creator, the days of your youth, while the evil days come not, the evil days refer to days where you could do things physically that you can't do anymore. Ain't nobody saying nothing here. And so, l let, me, let me get this and close this. The Apostle Paul in our text takes the opportunity to encourage the believers in, Corinthian, in, the, in the Corinthian church. And I believe it's applicable to us today. And his encouragement and exhortation is for us, I love this part. To raise our level of service to exceptional. Don't just serve, but raise it to a level where people are in awe of the level of service that you give. He encourages them not to just serve and work for the Lord, but to take it to an exceptional level. He exhorts us to be devoted to the Lord's work. Now, I'm not against being devoted to other parts of your life. You should work hard on your education. You should work hard at your place of employment. You should work hard to be promoted. You should work hard to be recognized. You should work hard to be the best. But your devotion shouldn't stop when you come to church. You shouldn't serve in the world better than you serve in church. You shouldn't serve in your club better than you serve in church. You shouldn't serve in your neighborhood. Associate, I can go on and on and on. I'm not saying don't get in them. I'm saying don't give better service to them than you give to God. Ain't nobody saying nothing in here. He said raise God's work to an exceptional level. He exhorts us to be devoted to the Lord's work and to couple, join, co cooperate with other believers who exhibit the same level of devotion. It means get with people who are devoted. If you're devoted, don't hang around with undevoted folk. Get with folk that's devoted too. That's where the concept of auxiliary comes from. It's people who have the same focus, the same passion. The same desire. So they get together to do the same thing. If you love to sing and love to play and love music, you need to get with people who love to sing, love to play, and love. That's how auxiliaries get together. The concept is biblical. Bless his name. And so he says to us, he says, not only be devoted, but get with people. 
couple with people, cooperate with people that exhibit the same level of devotion. One of the most frustrating things that you can experience is to love something intensely and somebody who's helping you thinks nothing of it. That's, that's frustration personified because you want to do it at an A-plus level and they're just okay with a C-minus. Hello, somebody. So Paul encourages us, raise your level and then join with people who have the, who have the same level of devotion. Bless his name. The word devoted by definition, I'm three quarters done. The word devoted by definition means to be very loving and loyal, which sounds like a simple definition until you look at the word loyal. I won't even deal with love. We dealt with that in Sunday school this morning. I don't know how in the world the translators of the Bible translated seven different words, L-O-V-E. Bless his name. But when you look at the definition of loyal, Loyal, by definition, is giving and showing allegiance. It is firm, constant, and steady support. I want to read that again. You want to know if you're loyal or not? See if these apply to you. Firm, not wishy-washy, not in and out. Stable, set, resolved, firm. Constant, not up and down, in and out, left and right. There. Steady. When a person is loyal to something, they are firm about what they believe. They're constant and consistent with it, and they support it. You can't prove that you love anything that you don't support. Bless his name. So that was, that's what Paul says to us. He says, be devoted to the work of God. He, he encourages us to be loyal, to be steady, and to be consistent in the work of the Lord. And then, I love this, he uses not a metaphor, but he uses a church in-house example to prove it to the rest of them. Now, we can't do that today. Because if I use somebody in our church as a good example, people be all jealous. He love him more than it. He love her more than No, you can't do that now. You can't do that. I wish we could, but we can't do that because uh, some people are so insecure that a compliment to somebody else seems like a put down to them. I'm not in the business of putting people down. I'm in the business of telling the truth. And whether you like it or not, some people are better worker in church than others. But I'll leave it up to you to say which ones are which. But Paul uses an in-house example to make his point. He uses a person in the Corinthian church to prove his point. He refers and urges us to consider the household of Stephanus. Stephanus, uh, we find out later on in the epistle, was responsible for taking the letter to Paul with the questions that they had. All those questions that we answered in, in 1 Corinthians, there was a letter sent to Paul. Stephanus was one of the persons who took that letter to Paul so that he could respond. So, so you know, Stephanus was already at work. Ain't no telling what all he was doing. He carried a letter. And th th there's really no, uh, there's really no, it, there's not an itemized list of what all Stephanus did. But we can tell that Stephanus did a lot by how Paul described him. And his description of Stephanus and his household is that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Can anybody in a good fashion say that you're addicted? They might be able to say you're addicted, but can they say you're addicted in a good fashion? 
what he said. He said the household of Stephanus and his description of that household, meaning not just Stephanus himself, but the people Stephanus had influence over. It says, it's in there. They have, they means more than one. They have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. They, they've addicted themselves to service. Now, let me explain it now so, because some of y'all are a little uncomfortable now. But let me, let me set you at ease. Although the word addicted carries such negative connotations in our present society, we have to bear in mind that Paul here is commending them. Addicted to the ministry of the saints was not a slam. It was a compliment. He was complimenting. The, uh, ain't nobody, when the last time you got complimented about being addicted to something? So, so, so Paul, Paul, Paul is compliment, he's complimenting them by saying that they are addicted. And so we got to bear in mind that he's commending them and he is saying that the stance they took by being addicted to the ministry of the saints, it's noble, it's an honorable position to stand in. He's saying to them that it's good for them to have this habit. Look, somebody say, it's my habit. Now ask him, say, now what are you addicted to? Don't answer. Don't nobody answer. Don't, no, don't nobody answer that. Don't answer. I said just ask him. That's a rhetorical question. We don't want to answer right now. Okay, we want to change your, we want to change your answer before you, before you answer it. So, so, so here it is. Here it is. In our society, addicted means to be physically and mentally dependent on something against your will. And an inability to stop it without adverse effects. It means you're addicted to something against your will. You don't want to be addicted. But you're so addicted to it that if you try to stop, you get adverse effects from it. Everybody got that? You know what I found out about most drunks? They don't want to be drunks. It's against their will. If they could get off it, they would. But every time they get off it, they get the DTs. I just, now, I just use alcohol. You can fill in the blank. Listen, you'll get, you'll get DTs from chocolate. I, 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 I ain't guessing right now. I'm telling you what I know. Caffeine, coffee. Anything you're addicted to, if you've been addicted to it for a while and your body has become accustomed to it, when you try to, listen, that's why there are 7 and 9 and 10 and 12 step programs because cold turkey has some adverse effects. So, 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 I'm just about done, just about done. So, 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 it, you can't stop it with adverse effects. Most people that I know are addicted didn't addict themselves on purpose. One hit got you hooked. You didn't try to do it. Wasn't your intention to do it. I, I, I didn't mean to be spending $75 a week on chocolate. I, I have to tell you all that story another day. Most people who get addicted, not by choice, they are grabbed against their will. Bless his name. But, 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 but. The Greek term for the word addicted in this verse doesn't mean bound. The word is tasso. And tasso means to arrange it in a certain order. Watch this now. Tasso means, addicted in the Greek means, not grabbed against your will. 
It means that you got a series of things and then you got to put them in the order of what you feel is most important. Everybody catch it? So, it means to arrange. It means to set it in a certain order. It means to set something in position with some degree of priority. To be addicted just means, in this sense, to put the most important things first to make sure they get done. We do that all the time, don't we? We pay our mortgage before we pay our cable bill. We pay our water before we buy a new pair of, sho a new pair of shoes. So to be addicted in this sense means that you have put the most important things first and you make sure they get done so they're not left undone. Now, what does that say? The Amplified Bible says, instead of they have addicted themselves, it says they have consecrated and devoted themselves to the ministry and the service of the saints. Have you did that? Are you consecrated and set aside so that the saints can get the benefit of your gift, of your talent, of your service, of your time? Have you put yourself in a place that if God want to use you, he don't have to go far to get you to use you? He said they consecrated and devoted themselves to the ministry. We know consecration means to set it aside solely for the use of God. That's what consecrate means. It means to sanctify it and set it aside. Y'all know that's what we was doing in, in January, right? We were consecrated. We wasn't just trying to lose weight. We wasn't just trying to get to the... Yo, why y'all looking at me like that? Okay, that's, listen, the reason we stop eating donuts and cake and pie and because we're constant, we were trying to get in a place so that God wanted to use us, he could use us. To consecrate doesn't mean just set it aside. It means set it aside so God can use it. So let, me, let me tell you about that china cabinet again. That china cabinet was only off limits to people who lived in the house. But when certain people came to the house, they went to the china cabinet. And we're saying we want to be set aside so that every time God get ready to use us, we can be used. I'm just about done. Because y'all looking, y'all look like y'all choking on this. I, I ain't trying to choke you. I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying, I'm just trying to tell the truth. Uh, the preacher just trying to tell the truth. So, so, so it says that they are consecrated and devoted themselves to the ministry. So, so Stephanus, Stephanus's household has set a high priority on serving the saints. How high is serving the saints on your list? Or is it high? So, so, so. Their addiction to the ministry of the saints wasn't a slavery. It wasn't bondage against their will. But it was a voluntary, prioritized commitment to the Lord's work of serving God's people. It means they made a decision to get it done. It was their habit. And when you got a habit like that, Church becomes your fix. Praise, 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 praise is what kind of. Anybody saying nothing in here? Now, now can I, I want to be honest. I'm just using the language. I don't know much about this at all. I just know what I heard. So, so it was their habit, service of devotion. That they had made through a decision. You don't get devoted by accident. 
You look around church and you see people that always seem to be in place and always seem to be working for the Lord and always seem to be going. I want you to know something about those people. Those people didn't get like that by accident. Those people made a decision. And then after they made a decision, they devoted themselves to the decision they make. You know what happens every January? People make decisions absent of devotion. And a decision to go to the gym, absent of devotions, will have you at home in February. It's quiet in here. And, and so, and so, <laughs> come on, Gary, get out of here. And so, and so, here's what I want to do. Here's my encouragement for you today as I close this message. Here's my encouragement for you. Okay. If you want to be devoted to the work of the Lord, there are three things that you have to do. You got to decide it once and for all. You got to devote to it. And then you have to do it. Look at somebody say decide it. Devote to it. And do it. One more time. Tell them say decide it. Devote to it. And do it. One last time. Say decide it. Devote to it and do it. Decide it means you have to settle it. You can't go back and forth. You have to make a decision and you got to stick with the decision that you make. Do you want to be saved or not? Do you want to be in church or not? Do you want to serve the Lord or not? Do you want to be a part of the auxiliary or not? Amen. So, so you got to, you got to, you have, when it comes to the work of the Lord and serving people, you got to make a decision. You know what's wrong with the fast food industry right now? We got so many people working in there who don't want to do it. That's why they're nasty behind the counter. That's why you can't talk to them. That's why all these TikToks now, people jump on the counter and they fighting all in the restaurant because you can't get common curtain. Come on here. They're doing something they don't want to do. Their heart ain't in it. They haven't decided. If they could be doing something else, they would. But this is the only thing they can do. So they're relocated. They're addicted in the wrong way. And you got to decide whether you want to serve God. You can't just serve him when things are going good. Because you're going to have some tough things happen in your life. You can get a sickness that you didn't know was coming. You can have some people betray you that you thought were low. You're going to have some things happen in your life. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. You don't get to skip the rest of the day when you come on the Lord's side. That's why there's a suit of armor waiting for you. Bless his name. Look at somebody say, decide it. We must settle and decide two things. We must decide who God made us, because if you settle on who God made you, you'll stop trying to be somebody else. And then you got to settle what it is God has for you to do. Too many people are in the wrong lane doing things that are not assigned to them because it looks popular and good. But God has given you a gift set for the lane you run in. I found out something. You know everybody trying to get the outside lanes when they run. But I found out that the inside lane is good for people with short legs. Are you with me? So, so you got to decide it. You got to decide, I got to be who God made me. And I have to do what God has assigned to me. Okay. Give me about five minutes and I'll finish. Just as sure as you're saved, you have an assignment. I want you to hear me good right now. Because too many people are saved, sitting down, doing nothing for the work. And when God saved you, you had to settle two things. First of all, you had to settle who he made you. I'm not the person I used to be in the streets now. I'm not the club hopper, the drinker, the smoker, the blunt blower. I'm not that anymore. Did I, did I say blunt blower? I, I just made something. I just made something up just then. 
Okay, I just, I may, I just, I just made, I just made something up. Okay, I told y'all I didn't know nothing about that area. Didn't I tell you that? Okay, all right. So, so, but, but, I, but I know this. But I know this. I know this. I know the Bible says now, you are a holy nation. You're a peculiar people. You're a royal priesthood. Ain't that what it says? It says you're a chosen generation. That's who God made you. But a priest that won't pray ain't a priest. That means not only has he made you somebody, he made something for you to do. Chosen generation, royal priesthood, holy nation, that's who God made you. And many times we get consumed with who he made us. And we never get around to our assignment. You got a gift. You got at least one. But what good is a gift if you don't know what to do with it? I love my brother. I got to talk to him, though. My brother Bobby, he left me the most extensive tool set I have ever seen. Bobby got tools I ain't never seen before. I got a tool for everything. But some of them tools, I don't know what they are. I don't know what to do with them, so I can't get the good of it. And what good is a gift that you have that you don't know how to use? You don't know where to use it. You don't know who to use it on. Look at your neighbor and say, find your assignment. Ask them, say, what's your habit? You need a habit. You need something that you can do consistently. Bless his name. So we must decide who we are and what we're going to do. Say devote to it. Devote means commit yourself to it. Whatever gift, whatever talent, whatever ministry you are in, settle on it. Don't be a ping pong ball from place to place, thing to thing. Look at your gift set. Your gift set will tell you where you need to be. Ain't nobody saying nothing in here. Listen, be consistent. Be loyal to it. Remember this. It's not who you do it to. It's who you do it for. Let your light so shine before. It's to them, but it must glorify your father. It's for him. To them, for him. To them. One more time. To him. For. Bless his name. Colossians 3.23 says, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily. That's with devotion. As unto the Lord and not unto men. Look at somebody say, be devoted to your ministry. Devotion to your ministry is a devotion to your God. It's not to a pastor. It's not to a place. It's not to an event. It's to God. Pastor Bush not going to pay you for singing. No, no, I'm not. You know why? Because God going to pay you. I'm not the one who asked you to sing. God did. That means God is the one who's going to pay you. Are you with me? Look at somebody say, decide it. Devote to it. And lastly, do it. Look at somebody say, do it. Whatever you do, do it. Look at them, look at them again and say, do it. Stop making excuses. Stop waiting for the conditions to be just right. Y'all know what Nike said, don't you? Just do it. Ain't that what Nike said? Let me give you a better one. Y'all know what the cable guy said? Get her done. I thought, I thought that would give him a little laugh, but... And we laugh, but I want you to bow your heads, but I want you to know how serious God is. In the church I came out of, we sang a song that said, be ready when he comes. Be ready when he comes. Be ready when he comes. He's coming again so soon. Then we sang a verse that said this, don't let him catch you. 
with your work undone. Don't let him catch you with your work undone. Don't let him catch you with your work undone. He's coming. One more time. Don't let him catch you with your work undone. Don't let him catch you with your work undone. Don't let him catch you with your work undone. He's coming. Against, all right, clap your hands right there. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your prayers. Amen. Grayson, Grayson came and said, Papa, you going to tune up today? I said, I, I said, I don't know, Grayson. Uh, but I think I did a little earlier. But this is the day you got to hear the word. And our, our word is not just coming with instruction. Our word is coming with warning. You've been hanging out too long. It's time to be about your father's business. I want to offer prayer today. Well, Pastor, I know I got a gift set, but you don't know my schedule and you don't know what's going on. And I want to do more, but I just am not able to do more. Well, I want you to know something. The Bible says with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And if you truly want to do it and it's an honest desire, God will orchestrate it so that you can get it done. But he ain't going to do everything for you. The will has to be yours. He'll open the door, he, and he'll, you know, he'll, he'll spread the carpet out for you, but he got, he's not going to take the steps for you. The steps are yours. The Bible says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall, be, shall find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Everyone that asks receives. So I want you to understand something. If you really want to do more for the Lord, he'll make it so that you can. And if that's your desire, I'm just going to ask you to stand right where you are. I'm going to pray this prayer of faith, and then we're going to finish this evening, finish this morning, rather. I need to do more. I want to do more. I don't know how to do more, but I feel the unction and the urge in my spirit. I spent so much time in the world, and I gave so much service there. I know I got to give more service to the Lord. I just don't know quite how to do it, and, and you're the person I'm talking to. You're the one I want to stand, because I want to pray with you. I'm going to pray that your understanding be enlightened so that you know what the will of the Lord is. The will of the Lord is not titles and positions and hand claps and pats on the back and the glory of people. The work of the Lord is helping somebody in need. And if you have a heart to help people, then you want to be used by God. Come on, stand up. I know you're in here. I could put my finger on you. I just heard the Spirit of the Lord said, you've been living your life selfishly with only you in mind. And he wants to open a new horizon. Ask any giver who's a giver from heart. There is no joy like giving to somebody else. When I was younger, I loved Christmas because I loved to receive gifts. The greatest gift or the, rather, the greatest thrill that I get out of Christmas now is watching the face of my grandkids now after I've given it to them. The late Mother Carr, my mother's church mother, told her, said, I've learned the secret of living. She said, the secret of living is giving. And when you're able to give and serve, it'll, it'll push you into an arena that far exceeds your expectations. Lift your hands to God. I want you to prepare yourself for real change today because he's going to change your mind and your desire. It's one thing to change your mind, but when your nature changes around this issue, it'll change your behavior. Father, in Jesus' name, there are men and women on the floor now. They didn't really stand because I asked them. They stood because the anointing of your word convinced them that they can do more for the kingdom of God. And as our example, Stephanus, 
who consecrated and devoted himself and addicted himself to helping the saints. I pray, Lord, for the same consecration, the same devotion, the same commitment to the things of God. Would you let it be their waking thought and their last image in the evening? Would you let the word come before them so that they can meditate on it day and night? Would you make them like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bring forth their fruit in their season? I pray for a mind change. I pray for a heart change. I pray, God, for an affection, a strong, intense love and loyalty. Not to people, not to places, not to things, but to the God that saved their soul. Help us to sell out for you, to give up all, to give up everything, to sell all that we have in search of the pearls of great price and then Lord as Paul was refreshed by the health by the house of Stephanus let us be a refreshing to the people of God and I believe you to do it because your word said it in Jesus name and the Lord's people said thank God come on one more time say thank God amen now here's what I want here's what I want here's what I want I want, I want to anoint my hands, and you that stood, I want to agree with you. Mm -hmm. If you get that oil for me, please, you get it. I want you to step out for me. Listen, here's my agreement. My, my, my agreement with you is what you have just asked God for, that he would grant it for you. Not that you're, the Bible says, if we touch and agree, when I touch, and agree with you what you have told God that you wanted. I just set myself in agreement and I make a covenant with you. In Jesus' name, let it be so. Let it be done in Jesus' name. Let it be so. Let it be done in Jesus' name. Let it be so. Let it be done in Jesus' name. Let it be so. Let it be done in Jesus' name. Yes. Let it be so.